13 minutes after 7, welcome to my banner here on the AM show. Now, how about a document that says that the views of women are represented in national policy formulation? Uh, what if your voice as a woman is heard, seen, represented in every aspect of our national lives? Well, it looks like the Gender Ministry uh, uh, is seeking to achieve something here. Yesterday, they launched a, a certain national gender policy and we want to open up some of the issues. So I've been joined by Program Officer, uh, Policy Planning, Monitoring and Evaluation Director with the Ministry of Children, Gender, Social Protection. Uh, Clark No Yoru is my guest this morning. Hello, good morning. Good morning. I had to break it down so I don't get it wrong. Very well. Okay. Uh, so you have a, a national gender policy. First of all, what does it mean? Thank you very much. Uh, I think the national gender policy, as you rightly said, was launched yesterday. This has been a very long journey and um, in terms of making sure that we give policy direction to the issues relating to women. Mm -hmm. And uh, since 1975, there had been some attempt to ensure that the rights of women were guaranteed. And pertinent to that, there was the need to come out with what we call the national gender machinery or the national women machinery. This machinery was intended to ensure that the welfare of women and girls were well articulated. And proud to that, there had been some attempts to ensure that the rights of women were ensured. And just after the national gender machinery, following the Benjamin. Uh, conference which led to the the, 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 the the international community adopting what we call the CEDAW, the Convention on the uh, Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women. There was a need for government to take that proactive measure to ensure that women are well represented, women issues are well connected to national development. So there were some few guidelines that came on board to ensure that there was gender issues mainstream in national development agenda. And based on that, some certain guidelines came up. However, we felt that those guidelines were basically to ensure that women are represented at a political level. Mm. And then again, to make sure that women are represented in all sectors of our economy. And flowing from that, there was a need to, in 2001, to come out with what we call the Minister of, Gen the Minister of Women and Children's Affairs. And based on that, there was a need to come up with a policy because once the ministry is set up, there's always a need to come up with a policy direction for that ministry. So prior to that, in 2004, there was what we call the gender and children's policy. So you realize that it was gender and children. And uh, because of that, emphasis was laid on both gender and children. But you could see that gender issues are very, very important and as well as that of children. And marrying the two was a little bit murky, so there was a need to decouple the issues relating to gender from that of children. So when the Minister of Gender, Children and Social Protection was created in 2013, there was a need to now come out with a policy direction. As I rightly said, when a ministry is created, there is always the need to come out with a policy direction that will show the extent to which that ministry will operate. Mm. So in 2013, when the Minister of Gender, Children and, and Children Protection was created by Executive Instrument 1, there was a need to, for us to come out with this national gender policy. And as I say, it's been a long, long, long journey mm -hmm. until yesterday. We were lucky to have it launched. Okay. So back to the question of what does it mean now that it's, it's been launched? Very well. I think the most important thing that this policy is looking at, if you, if you recall when I mentioned the gender and children's policy, Emphasis was being laid on that of women. But here we want to look at gender because we don't want people to misconstrue the issues of women vis-a-vis -vis that of gender. Basically, when we talk about gender, we are looking at making sure that all sexes are well taken care of, so to say. But that's almost impossible, isn't it? It's, it's not impossible because every sex, every human being has a potential. And, and for that reason, there's a need to create that venue for that human being to exploit and use his or her potential. But if you look at the system that we have, it's a little bit discriminatory towards women. So this policy, as I said, is looking at gender, promoting gender mainstreaming, making sure that every human being, whether boy, girl, woman, man, 
is giving that opportunity to be able to unearth his or her skills. And uh, you realize that, uh, but more often than not, emphasis, we want to place emphasis on women because of the discriminatory practices that are being meted out to women. Issues relating to empowerment, you realize that women are not well empowered. Issues relating to economic opportunities for women, you realize that the men are at an advantage over that of women. Issues relating to justice, you realize that there's violence against women, there's violence against girls, and all those things. So this policy actually is looking at making sure that every single human being, man, woman, boy, girl, is, well, is given the opportunity to unearth his or her talents. Mm. However, emphasis is being placed on women because of the vulnerable state in which women find themselves because of the discriminatory practices that women find themselves. Mm. How are you going to translate uh, the nice things contained in this document to actually the ground? So a woman who is looking for a job, for instance, uh, a woman who feels she's been abused by, you know, some man and she's going up and down to the police station, uh, they having to find proof and things like that. How is this going to translate? How is it going to help the ordinary person? Very well. I think uh, one key thing is coming out with a policy because the policy will identify who does what and at what time. Again, uh, one of the things that will, that will give effect to this policy is we are coming out with what we call a strategic implementation plan. And this strategic implementation plan will identify the various stakeholders, will identify the details, the nitty gritty that goes into it. And again, if you look at the policy, there's a provision that relates to institutional roles and responsibility. For instance, if you pick access to justice, every security agency is well captured in the policy to the extent that the Ministry of the Interior has to mainstream the national gender policy into its plans and strategies. So it means that when it comes to practical ways of dealing with it, every institution which is being mentioned in the policy both government institution and civil society organizations which have been mentioned in the policy will be given detailed roles and responsibility in the strategic implementation plan. So it means that all of us have to be on board and uh, again if you look at the policy there are certain commitments that are being made. If you look at the policy to there are certain institutions that are being tax to do certain things relating to Are the policy. Are they doing it because there's a law backing it, you know, more like it's binding on them, or they're doing it because they feel it's the right thing to do? Increasingly, you realize that issues of women are that of human rights. So it means that if you are a government institution or you are a civil society organization or whoever you find yourself, it is as your sacred duty to make sure that issues relating to women are being upheld. And as I rightly said, there are certain laws that are being promulgated in Ghana which protect everybody, including women and girls. So it means that it is a re the responsibility of every single stakeholder to make sure that the provisions provided for in the policy documents are being upheld. And being a policy document becomes the, the blueprint for Ghana in terms of the way forward in uh, ensuring that the welfare of women girls and boys and children and, uh, are really protected. So it means that it's a binding document to everybody. Mm. Once because you... it derives its source from the 1992 constitution as well as other statutes relating to women and children. Okay, and I'm happy that you work with the uh, monitoring and evaluation directorate. So even with the policies that you've had in the past, uh, one pertaining to gender children, how well have you monitored how well it's been implemented on the ground? Very well. I think uh, one key thing that we do as a directorate is to ensure that we come up with some framework to guide how certain policy documents in the ministry are implemented. And coming back to your question as to how we've been able to do that, it's if you read uh, the NDPC has the document that they call the Annual Progress Report, API. Mm -hmm which catalogs all the things that we do. So one of the key things that we do is to develop a monitoring evaluation framework which will guide implementers, that, or which will guide stakeholders in the gender agenda, so to say. So it means that if it comes to issues of access to justice, there's a template that we have which tries to catalog all the things that the, sec that the sector does. When it's got to do with issues relating to women empowerment, there's a template that we have that guides us to be able to measure as to what, first of all, to identify which institution is doing what. If you go to Ministry of Health, they also have a very, very important document 
relating to women affairs or relating to reproductive health. So we are able to capture all these things. And then one key thing that we do is coordination because the ministry does a lot of coordination. So we're able to coordinate with other sectors, for instance, Minister of Health, Minister of Agri, Minister of Education, to really find out what they are doing. And based on that, we're able to monitor or we're able to identify some of the issues they do and then identify gaps. And that actually fed into the development of, of this policy. Mm. So if, if I ask for a, a progress report, a summary of it, uh, how impactful has the policy been? What would you say? In respect of this policy or No, because other this is yet to be carried. So the, the other policy w with respect to the gender children, the, the one you had before this national gender policy. Very well. You, if you look at uh, the progress, if you, yesterday if you listen to the Honorable Minister's statement, you realize that she catalogued a lot of interventions that the ministry has carried on. So all these policies in terms of if you pick LEAP, for instance, is one of the biggest achievements of the ministry. And this is uh, based on the policies and programs that the ministry have. I, I still you, have a question on LEAP, though. Uh, does it make people depend on, on the project for, like, forever? Because how would you be independent of it? You know, the, it, doesn't, it doesn't tell us how it ends, does it? Well, I'm, I'm not a lead, uh, leap expert here, but the bottom line is that there, there's, there's some steps that we are taking to make sure that people, because you can't give, uh, you can't continuously give people in perpetuity mm. at a point, there has to be an exit point. And one of the interventions that we are looking at is making sure that we provide what we call complementary support so that you don't benefit from leave forever. There has to be a point of exit for which a person should be supported by which time the person capacity has been built, the person has been given the needed support, has been given the needed training to be able to lean on himself or herself. Mm. So LEAP, as the vision that we have is that at the end of the day, it's not going to be forever. At a point, there has to be an exit. So we have that plan in place. But coming back to the issue as to the, the impact of some of the things, the policies that we have, if, as I mentioned, LEAP is one of them. If you look at the, 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 the number of laws that have come up, it's based on the fact that on relating to women and children. It's based on the policies and programs that the ministry has implemented, identified certain gaps and all those things. Again, if you, you I think uh, somewhere in before, be, uh, a couple of months ago, we also launched what we call the children and uh, child, and, uh, child and family welfare policy. Mm -hmm. All these things are derived from the policies because as you keep on doing implementation, you're able to identify certain gaps. And as we speak now, we have been taking steps to make sure that certain portions of the Children's Act are amended. So all these things are the achievement mm. or the implementation of the policies that we have done. That helps us to be able to identify certain gaps in policies. That helps us to identify certain uh, gaps in programming. And that helps us to identify certain areas in research. Mm. And all these things are as a result of the policies that we've implemented over the years. But you know that the bottom line of most of these problems is poverty. Uh, the fact that people are not able to take care of themselves. That's why they're having, you know, to rely on some of these interventions. So in the end, I see that even with this one, uh, you, you, you have a, a one on poverty, uh, which is feminization of poverty. Poverty is a major problem for women and girls in Ghana, especially rural women and female-headed households more than males. So what's the uh, exact guideline on that? Well, if you go to the policy document, there's a provision relating to empowerment, economic empowerment of women, or creating uh, opportunities for women. So one of the key things, poverty, as you rightly said, is we have feminization of poverty. And you have to come up with strategies that will ensure that we don't have that feminized poverty, so to say. Mm -hmm. So if you look at the policy document, there's a provision relating to economic empowerment of women. And we have detailed out strategies that will ensure that women are empowered, women have access to credit, women have access to land, because land becomes a major challenge. If you look at the, 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 the economy of Ghana, you realize that women constitute in the agri sector, women constitute a large chunk of the agri sector. Newer access to land becomes a challenge. Mm. So one of the policy direction or the strategies in the policy is to create these opportunities so that women can have access to land, to farm on their own. Again, you realize that when it comes to macroeconomic, when we are doing the macroeconomic analysis, we don't actually factor in the contribution of women in that respect. So one of the key things that we are looking at is to create economic opportunities for women to empower them. Because if a woman is well empowered, then that person comes out of that poverty. Because as you rightly said, you can't continuously give people cash transfer forever. 
But if you're able to empower that person, you're able to unearth the skills and talents of that person, then that person becomes self-dependent. And that is the focus of this policy. Okay. Big question, perhaps ending the conversation. Will women take advantage of this? Absolutely. I, I think women have already taken the advantage. The only thing we need to do is create the opportunities. Because if you look at, I always use my sector minister as an example. She's a very powerful woman. She's a very, very hardworking woman. And she serves as a role model to a number of the women out there. And there are a lot of women out there. The chief justice is there. She's very, very good. You go to the government statistician is there. And you can see that these are critical women who are taking decisions and who are promoting the agenda. So I think women are more than willing to take But all these mantle. women you, you cited, fantastic women, by the way, perfect role models, but they've got one thing in common. They're all very well educated. A lot of the women that we're seeking to target, uh, unfortunately, they don't have that kind of education. Very well. And, that, that's the, the, and the focus of this policy is empowerment. Because these women that I spoke about have been empowered through education. Mm. So the other women who, unfortunately, may not have access to education should be empowered. And once you're able to empower, if you empower a woman, believe you me, that woman is, 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 is more than a man. Mm. So all that this policy seeks to do is to empower women, is to make sure that we create opportunities. Because the other thing is lack of opportunities. So how, do we, how do we ensure that opportunities are available for the, a woman to take it up? Mm. And if that opportunity, and if all these opportunities are created and they are empowered, believe you me, the sky is the limit. So how soon should we begin measuring, uh, you know, uh, what you've outlined to yourself so that we know if you're progressing uh, or you're failing? Very well. As I said, we are now, we'll be coming out very pretty soon with a, a strategic implementation plan. Mm. And that strategic implementation plan will have what we call the output indicator with some monitoring evaluation indicators. So as far as this policy document is concerned, not until we're able to complete, and I think very soon we'll come out with a strategic implementation plan, we'll come out with a monitoring evaluation framework, and that will guide us as to the kind of indicators we should be looking at, income, uh, output indicators, we'll be looking at impact indicators in the monitoring evaluation framework of this policy. Mm. So once that is done and we are looking at probably a specified period of time, we should be able to measure the progress of this policy. All right, very well. I would like to say congratulations on this. We'll be looking out for what is next. I've got a friend who is watching us in the Kosombo. His name is MD Kwesi Ima. Uh, he will not straight away say congratulations, though. He says, on paper, this policy, like every other wonderful initiative, is very encouraging because it promises a new horizon on gender issues. But the problem has always been effective execution. I pray this policy attains all it hopes to achieve because properly managed, it will become a hallmark achievement for the ministry. So we are watching closely. Very well. <laughs> and I can assure you that it will be well implemented because the grassroots, we are not just looking at the top there, we are looking at the grassroots. Okay. And we will target and make sure that people at the grassroots who are the core to development are well targeted. Mm. And All right. Uh, I thank you for your time here. Uh, Clark. Noyoru is Program Officer, Policy Planning, Monitoring and Evaluation Directorate with the Ministry of Gender, Children, Social Protection. We will definitely have him again. He's exciting. But if you got the opportunity to go to Ambrotri, would you come back to Ghana? And if you were to go, oh, my cameraman says, no, 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 no. If you were to come back, what would you do? Uh, up next, we'll talk to some young persons who've had the opportunity, but they are back home and doing something. We'll tell you exactly what they're doing. Stay with us.